After the last emperor of China had been toppled, a warlord era ensued in China where um, in different areas, uh, local people with a lot of power, known as warlords, held sway. Um, and this is where our story begins. First of all, some key players. Who is Jiang Jieshi? Okay, so he is the leader, initially, of the military part of the KMT, but ultimately the, uh, pretty much the, 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 the leader of the KMT in general, in every respect. Uh, he is also known as Jiang Jieshi, so if you're writing essays about him, just be consistent. You can choose Chiang Kai-shek, that's fine, or Jiang Jieshi, just take your pick, okay? Remember at this time, Mao Zedong, although he's um, a member, of, although he's active in the Communist Party, he's not really the leader yet, okay? He's a young chap with ideals. So, this warlord era, what would you do if you were a politician um, in the Communist Party or the KMT, and there, was this, uh, there were all these warlords um, governing parts of China? Well, you might want to actually get rid of the warlords for a start, to have uh, some more influence yourself. So the KMT and the CCP joined forces in what is known as the United Front. Um, later on, there's a second United Front, because this is the first United Front. And they were targeting the warlords. So they went northwards and had a lot of success with defeating many of the warlords. However, they weren't, they weren't very fond of each other. Uh, in particular, Jiang Jieshi, Chiang Kai-shek, hated the communists. And he prepared, um, rather deviously, to attack them in Shanghai from trains um, as they came back from the, um, from the military campaign defeating the warlords. So they opened fire, and what ensued was known as the White Terror or the Shanghai Massacre and vast numbers of communist sympathizers and communists were just slaughtered and executed. Okay, so what would you do if you were a surviving communist and all those around you have been executed? Yeah, you might go underground, you might flee Shanghai, which is what many of them did. And um, a, lot, a group of communists set up what is known as a Soviet which is uh, kind of like a community where you run things on socialist principles. Um, and they went to a place, uh, a region called Jiangxi. Jiangxi. So I want you to pause the video and look up on the map where Jiangxi is. Okay, so the KMT were not going to give up on their desire to, to put an end to the communists. So they went after them to, towards Jiangxi and started attacking them. At the same time, Mao was becoming quite influential with, with peasants, and he was actually experimenting already with um, encouraging peasants to attack their landlords, okay, for land, so that land redistribution could occur, and these peasants who had never had land before could have some. So that was going on as well, his first forays into land redistribution. Now, the KMT struggled initially because the, um, the communists used a lot of guerrilla tactics, guerrilla warfare. Okay, so I'd like you to just look up guerrilla warfare, guerrilla tactics now as well, so you have an understanding of what that is before you continue. Now, ultimately the KMT put so much pressure on the communists in the Jiangxi Soviet that they, they couldn't just hang around there any longer. So they went off. Um, and began the Long March, which was an endless um, march through very hostile terrain, high mountains, freezing temperatures, uh, with very little equipment. And as many as 90% of the people on this march died. Um, so a very, a very small proportion survived, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But first I'd like to pause the video again and find out how long was this march, so how many kilometers or yeah, kilometers, and how long did it take. Also, can you find out anything about how many mountain ranges or mountains they had to climb?
Okay, so during this long march at a meeting in Zunyi, somewhere in the mountains, uh, Mao began to really take power and he doubted the tactics that had been used before and people began to agree with him on a particular route that they should take whilst others disagreed. But the fact that Mao was successful and had enough people wanting to go with him really solidified his position in the CCP at this point. So he ended up at the end of this long, long, long march. <gasps> so long. Um, in a marsh land. So they've just imagined you've come down the mountains, you're absolutely shattered if you're a survivor, luckily enough. Then you've got this huge marsh with, uh, in which you might die because there's lots of um, sinking mud and um, you have to tread very carefully. Finally, they arrive in a place called Yan'an, okay? So you need to remember that name of Yan'an because it becomes very important later on in the Yan'an period or the Yan'an years. Okay, you might understand though why the Long March was so important. It showed that communists were strong and the communists could use it to their advantage um, in future times and it's still remembered with very, through, with very rose tinted glasses today as being a time when they were almost like they were blessed. Almost like this, this was proof that they were an amazingly powerful party. Whereas actually, of course, vast numbers of them had died. So remember the Long March and its importance. Remember that they arrived in Yenan after that Long March. Now, in 1936, bizarrely, Chiang Kai-shek gets kidnapped. But why? This is the 6th of April, 1936. He gets kidnapped. Okay, there are a few reasons for this. Japan um, had actually invaded Manchuria, which is the northern part of China. Manchuria. I'd like to pause the video and write down that word, Manchuria. And it's now no longer called Manchuria. Okay, but it was, um, it was a distinct region previously. And now the Manchurians have pretty much blended in with Han Chinese culture, so you, they're, almost indis they're pretty much indistinguishable. Now, why? Why a kidnapped Chiang Kai-shek? Well, as I said, the Japanese had actually invaded Manchuria in the early 1930s. And the Xi'an incident in 1936 was partly due to dissatisfaction amongst KMT members um, with Chiang Kai-shek's or Jiang Jieshi's very uh, chilled out response, relaxed response to the Japanese. He wasn't doing much to combat them. In fact, he adopted a policy called trading space for time. He thought China's so big, um, let's let, you know, if they take a little bit of it, that's all right. We'll sort of, uh, we'll get them another time. They were, it has to be said, militarily highly superior to the KMT. And so he was probably reluctant to just go to battle immediately and, and, and lose. So I think he was, he was kind of just putting things off. He was a big procrastinator, perhaps, in that respect, and also, he was a hater of the communists, and so there's that as well. Maybe he wanted to actually defeat, defeat the communists first. However, the KMT was so angry that nothing was being done to stop the Japanese invading China through Manchuria, that Zhang Xueliang, he's a man called Zhang Xueliang, based around Xi'an, um, formerly a warlord, I'm just gonna become him to help you remember him. I'm Zhang Xueliang. I really dislike uh, the fact that uh, Chiang Kai-shek is not making an effort to defeat the, the Japanese and quite frankly I'm really willing to do anything to change things. Now my father sadly was, was killed by the Japanese in Manchuria so I have strong feelings about, um, about this invasion for very personal reasons as you can imagine. Um, and. Yes, I think we, we, we should be responding. Now, actually, as you can tell from my hat, I don't look particularly Chinese. Well, I, I, was, a, I was a warlord myself once, but then um, I joined the KMT. But I, I wanted to collude with the communists. We're going, we're going to collude here at this point in history to take him, to take Chiang Kai-shek and kidnap him because we want him to agree to the following. We want him to agree that we should fight together 
the, Jap the, the, the communists and the, and the KMT should fight together to defeat the Japanese, our common enemy. I mean, it should be bloody obvious, no? Okay. So Chiang Kai-shek was actually kidnapped. Isn't that crazy? The communists had three demands uh, with the Xi'an incident, as it is known. They would release Chiang Kai-shek on three conditions. Firstly, the communists had to be recognized as a proper political party. Secondly, they were no longer to be persecuted by the KMT, chased, attacked. Thirdly, they would fight together. As I've already said, they would fight the Japanese together to defeat them. Okay, and thus it was that the Second United Front was formed and they could um, attack the Japanese together as part of the Second United Front. Okay, so I'd like you to remember all of the things mentioned in this video. Um, and it will give you, it's very general um, what I've said here, and I'm sure that I'm lacking a few details that might have fleshed out the picture better for you. But this gives you the bare bones of what you need to kind of get going now, okay?